Please excuse me this morning. <clears throat> I have a bit of a dry throat, by the way. Welcome. Didn't uh, see you come in. Glad you're with us this morning. Yeah, as I was mentioning, we have several people that are out today, so um, we've just been praying for them. But as uh, I've been saying this morning, we are going to look at the fourth commandment, a commandment which we're going to see in just a few moments is one that's, well, virtually dismissed in the majority of evangelical churches as being not relevant for today. And I'll give you some of that reasoning. And as we go through this series, we're going to want to answer some of these objections. Uh, but uh, again, this morning, mainly what we're going to look at are uh, the fact that there are disagreements in the church over it, and secondly, an argument for the need for such a day from natural revelation, and that I'm taking from Jonathan Edwards, who uh, liked to address his congregation not just from the Bible, because he knew there were people in the congregation who didn't respect it, but from that which God reveals to all men through nature, something through reason that they could not deny. All right, so let's begin with the reading. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Uh, the Lord spoke these words to Moses, I believe, and actually he thundered from the mountain to all the people in such a way that made them afraid because he wanted them to remember these words, okay? So remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, let me stop there just for a minute, and, and really everything we're supposed to do is encapsulated in those words. Remember that day of rest which God has commanded. Keep that day holy, which means keep it separated from the other days to the Lord for His purposes. And all of that's spelled out in the Bible, but that, that's the main point. Okay, six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant, or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. By the way, we're going to look at that particular item tonight the establishing of the Sabbath at the creation and indications that it was observed from that time on to the time when it's given on Mount Sinai, as we see here, uh, to Moses and the people of God. All right. <clears throat> By the way, I should mention also Old Testament indications that it continues into the New Covenant. Now, last week, uh, we finished the Reformation series uh, by looking at the, the Synod of Dort, uh, which is famous, of course, for their basically formulation of five Calvinistic answers to five Arminian objections. And we covered all of that last, last couple of weeks. Now, uh, Godfrey concluded his, his lecture on the Synod by saying that they took up a few items towards the end of the Synod. Uh, first, how they might encourage their youth to learn the catechism. And by the way, th that's very important because the catechism is basically a summary of everything the Bible teaches and it's, it's so helpful to have that understanding, as it were, in your thinking when you're reading the Bible so you know what the whole message is instead of just small parts of it. So it's important not only for children, it's also important for adults. They believe that to be very important that they should also prepare a new Dutch translation of the Bible, one that was accurate, one that was in the common language of the people, and the one they prepared became essentially the King James Version for the Dutch people for the next couple of centuries. So it was a very good translation. They talked about which Reformed confession they should adopt for their denomination, and they chose the Belgic Confession, and, and that's because the Westminster Confession of Faith wasn't yet available. I think they would have chosen that one if they had had that one as an option. I may, I'm just kidding. But anyway, from all those available, they chose the, the Belgic Confession. And lastly, he said, they talked about the importance for God's people to keep the Christian Sabbath. Now, at this point in time, the Puritan movement had begun in England with William Perkins and others towards the 
the end of the 16th century, so late 1500s and into the early 1600s, the Synod of Dort was taking place in the early 1600s. Writings of the Puritans were, were basically in Latin in, in those days, you know, so everybody, every scholar could read them. It was being read in, in the Netherlands, and they were latching on to the idea that the Sabbath was very important. And so they began talking about that and how they might encourage their people to, to keep it. Now, Godfrey reminded us that the Sabbath is all but lost today, and it has greatly weakened the church. And so I, as I thought about that, I mean, how could I not think about doing a series on this? And not only that, but how the ladies had recently discussed the Sabbath in the study they're doing on those every other Tuesday evenings with Sinclair Ferguson. And how that led to an opportunity for, for Donna and me to talk to some dear Christian friends. And as we were speaking with them, we understood, even, even though they're a part of a Reformed church, they, they knew so very little about the Sabbath. They, they were pretty much on board with broad evangelicalism that it doesn't really apply for today. And then how we were also recently admonished by R.C. Sproul through a video lecture series, not only on the need to defend... The, the evidence for God's existence and the fact that the Bible is His Word, but also to be ready to defend everything that the Bible teaches, okay? That is our obligation as believers. Uh, that's what it means to be an apologist, you know, not just giving arguments to the unbeliever about the existence of God and, you know, again, the validity of Scripture and their need to trust in Christ, but as Machen, who was basically the founder of this denomination, said, we have to be ready also to answer all those other, you know, problems, the, the, the problem in the thinking of Christians to help them get on the right path and to be strengthened and to become more de devoted to the Lord and to please Him more. So with all of those things in mind, I was thinking, it, well, it seemed as though the Lord was providentially leading us to look again at this subject, as I've already said, it's, it's so neglected and rejected in the church today. This is an area where the church needs a lot of work, and we need to be convinced before we'll be able to help others. So I want us to look at this subject, you know, not in, in exhaustive detail, but in more detail than just one sermon will give us. So I think we're looking perhaps at, I don't know, maybe six or eight or ten sermons. On, on the Sabbath, and, and that just scratches the surface. So this morning, let's begin by considering just these two points. First of all, that we need to recognize that there is a great deal of disagreement in the church on the Sabbath, which I think we're already aware of. And secondly, reasons that we should embrace it, first of all, simply from natural revelation. And as I've already told you, Jonathan Edwards is going to be the one I rely on to make those particular points. Now, first of all, let's recognize there are disagreements in the church on the Sabbath, which shouldn't come as a surprise because there are disagreements within this denomination on the Sabbath. Even though we have a confession that spells out what we're supposed to believe fairly clearly, and I think if we were to survey each of us, even the few of us that are here this morning, we'd find that we also have differences among ourselves. So it shouldn't surprise us. There are differences in the church. Now, John MacArthur's position, a man who is very respectable, somebody who worked with R.C. Sproul, pastors a very large church down in Panorama City, I believe it is, uh, that the Sabbath is no longer binding on the church, on the New Covenant Church, he wouldn't use that term, New Covenant Church, he would basically say, on the church, is representative of the majority view in evangelicalism today. Now, he argues that whereas nine of the Ten Commandments are, are still in force, repeated by the Lord Jesus Christ in the New Testament, and are morally binding on us, we, we do need to keep them because it's the right thing to do. He says... The fourth was not repeated by Jesus. Kind of wonder about that. Um, because, he says, it is not a moral commandment. Let me give to you a quote from one of his sermons. By the way, his sermons are online. And there's not only the audio portion, but there's also a transcription. So that makes it easy. I don't have to transcribe by listening. You can just simply cut and paste. So this comes from one of his sermons. There is no question, quote, there is no question about the other nine commandments being permanent and binding. 
We are to have no other gods. We are never to make an idol. We are to worship only the true and living God. We are never to take the name of the Lord in vain. We are not to dishonor our father or mother, but rather give them honor. We are not to murder, commit adultery, steal, lie, or covet. Those are all moral mandates, moral commands, with the exception of verses 8 through 11. This is Exodus 20. The fourth commandment regarding the Sabbath. Okay, so these other nine are moral, but the one regarding the Sabbath is not moral. Now, why he would say such a thing, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, we'll look at that as we, as we go through. Now, he would also draw our attention to two passages from the New Testament that um, appear on the surface to indicate that the Sabbath is no longer binding, that it no longer continues. I'm not going to answer these today, by the way. I just want us to be aware that this discrepancy exists. Paul writes to the Colossians, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Okay, so here's one objection that needs to be answered. And to the Romans, where Paul writes, one person regards one day above another, another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. So in other words, Sabbath doesn't continue. We can keep the day or not keep the day. It doesn't really matter. But essentially, they believe it's been fulfilled, fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ, that it was a picture of the rest that Jesus was to bring us through his life and his death. For some, you know, such as our dear Christian friends that we spoke with, the Sabbath was a picture of our rest from our works, that we no longer need to work to earn our salvation. Now, that is something the Bible never has really taught us, except perhaps in the covenant of works under Adam. The challenge has been put out. If you want to try to justify yourself, this is what you're going to have to do. But salvation has never come through the keeping of the law, except by Christ's keeping of the law. Okay? So to think that this was basically a picture of resting from our works in the Lord Jesus Christ really misunderstands what the Old Testament was teaching because we have always been saved by grace through faith alone. Uh, for others, it was a picture of heaven. And Jesus has given us heaven through his work. So our rest is now in him. Since we're united with him and since he's in heaven and since we're basically resting in Christ, the future is secured, we no longer need this picture of the Sabbath. Okay, so there are those who believe the Sabbath simply does not continue. Now, there are others who believe the Sabbath does continue, but that we should keep it on the seventh day of the week, or we should keep it on Saturday. Uh, that's what the Seventh-day Adventists believe. That's what the Seventh-day Baptists believe. Now, the Adventists have historically gone so far as to say, and I saw the evidence with my own eyes because uh, when I was a part of another church years ago, we met in a Seventh-day Adventist building because they worship on Saturday, leaves the facility open on Sunday, and they often rent the facility out to Sunday worshiping people so they can raise some revenue. Okay, that yeah, makes sense. But in one of their back rooms, I saw their Revelation seminar information, and it looked pretty dire for those of us who worshiped on Sunday, because that literature said that the Sunday Sabbath is the false Sabbath of the devil, and to worship the Lord on Sunday is essentially to receive the mark of the beast, and it's to disregard God and shatter His commandments. I mean, they had some pretty serious stuff. So much so, we asked the, um, the pastor of the church, if you guys believe this, then why are you renting the building out to us? And he said, oh, well, some people in the denomination believe that, but we, we don't believe that. So apparently there's a difference of opinion. Well, still others believe the Sabbath continues, but it should be kept on the first day of the week instead of the seventh day of the week. The Old Covenant Sabbath, remember, was a commemoration of God's rest from the old creation. He, he created in six days, and He rested on the seventh day. But the new, the new Covenant Sabbath is a commemoration of Christ's rest 
from the work of the new creation. And we're going to see a lot about that in, in the future uh, sermons. And so the new covenant church uh, very um, uh, understandably worshiped on the first day of the week. And that's something that we see in the scripture. The reason being that Jesus rose on the first day of the week and entered into his rest. Now, among these, there are those who hold that the Sabbath, though it continues and should be observed on Sunday, is only for God's people and that unbelievers don't really need to worry about it. You know, Meredith Klein was the person who basically championed this view. He saw the Sabbath as a sign of a covenant, which it is, the covenant that God made with Israel, which is now fulfilled in the church, and our keeping of that Sabbath is an outward sign of God's covenant for His people, like that of circumcision, that shows not only that we belong to the true God, but that we are committed to following Him. And by the way, we would agree with that. He writes uh, this, Observance of the Sabbath by man is thus a confession that Yahweh is His Lord and Lord of all lords. Sabbath keeping expresses man's commitment to the service of his Lord. Now again, we, we would certainly agree with that. But he also believed that because it is a sign of God's covenant for the church, that it is the one commandment that does not apply to the world. So here he's, he, I guess you say, disagrees with John MacArthur that the church should keep it. But he agrees with John MacArthur that the world doesn't have to bother or have to worry about keeping it either. So when God judges the world, when he calls all men, all unbelievers, all unregenerate men to account for their sins on the day of judgment, even for every idle word that they've spoken, as Jesus has told us, he will not hold them accountable for breaking the fourth commandment. So for the church, not for the world. But others such as this denomination, believe that all are obligated to keep it, both believers and unbelievers. This is the position of the Westminster Confession of Faith. It is the position of our denomination because the Sabbath was ordained at the very beginning for all mankind. Now, let me just add one thing at this point that may be helpful. The commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It is a commandment, okay? It is something that God commands us to do, something He requires us to do. And when we hear that, we often, you know, it kind of makes us recoil a little bit. I, you know, I really, I don't like the idea that I have to do this. Kind of like, don't step on the grass. Makes you want to step on the grass. Don't touch the wet paint. Makes you want to touch the wet paint because of the sin inside of us. We immediately sort of feel that reaction against the idea of commandment. But we need to remember that Christ is Lord. And as the Lord, He has the right, the authority to command us. And as a matter of fact, He does command us. But at the same time, let's remember that neither Christ nor, of course, our Heavenly Father, who both command the same thing, ever command us anything that isn't at the same time good for us and best for us. Okay? I mean... Is it good or isn't it good to have the true God as your God? Well, of course it's good. He's the only one who is worthy of praise. He's the only one who can save us. Is it good to worship Him as He calls us to worship Him? Well, of course, because as those who know Him and love Him, we want to please Him. And He's told us how to please Him, how to worship Him. And so we, we want to do that. Uh, is it good to keep the promises and the vows that we have made to Him? Well, of course, God is true to us. He's going to keep His promises to us. We certainly want to keep our promises to Him. That is the good and right thing to do. Well, the Sabbath is also good because, as we're going to see in a moment, we need time to worship. We need time to draw away from the world and near to God Otherwise, we are going to be spiritual cripples our entire time in this world. Okay, we're saved by the righteousness of Christ, but that's no guarantee of what kind of spiritual life we're going to have. If we're not really committed to the Lord, if we're not serving Him, loving Him, drawing near to Him, 
and which is what we are to do on the Sabbath day, we are going to be spiritually crippled and weakened and really unable to do the things God calls us to do. That's simply a fact. Now, this brings us to our second point. We need to be convinced that this is something God wants us to do. That's step one. And then secondly, we need to do it. But let's begin with reasons why we believe there is a Sabbath and that it continues from reason or from natural revelation. Now, I don't know whether you noticed, but when I was reading what John MacArthur had to say, that quote a few moments ago, there was something that was conspicuously missing from his list. He says, the commandments give us the who that we are to worship. Well, you we're to worship no, no other gods, but only the true God. The commandments give us the how, that we're not to do it through idols. We're not to take His name in vain, lift it up to emptiness by making vows that we you know, really have no intention of following through with, or we, maybe we do intend to, but we don't, okay? But there was nothing about the when, okay? The who and the how, but not the when. That's what the Sabbath is all about. And if you take that piece out of the puzzle, we don't have really any indication as to when we are to worship the Lord. Now, Jonathan, argue, uh, Jonathan Edwards argues this in his three sermons on the Sabbath, which are, are very good, although very complicated. You think this is complicated. You should read those sermons. But he begins in his argument from natural revelation or reason for the reasons I've already given you. In case there's somebody in the congregation, which there were, who didn't respect the Bible, he wanted to make sure they understood this is what they needed to do. Now, okay, the first reason he gives for the Sabbath is that we know from nature that we owe this being who created us worship, okay? Now, we saw from our apologetic series the reasons that demonstrate the existence of God, that we don't need the Bible. We can know God exists from the creation and that um, He must be the one who made us because there's, there's nothing and no one else that could have except the one who is the first cause of all things. I'm not going to go through those arguments because we spent a great deal of time on them, although I would imagine if I were to give us all a test this morning, we would probably wouldn't pass it. Those things empty out of our minds so quickly, but we, you know, we will reflect on those things in the future. But knowing what we do know about God from the creation, we know that He is intelligent, we know that He has a purpose, we know that He is moral, and we know that because we know that whatever caused us cannot be less than us, and we have those characteristics within ourselves so we know that he had a purpose behind this. We know that, again, he is either pleased or displeased by the things that we do. And we know that because he has made us and takes care of us and is so infinitely greater than we are, that we owe him something. And what we owe him at the very least is thanks, you know, thanksgiving for what, what he's done for us. And glory, glory simply means giving him the credit for what he has done. Instead of saying all this material just existed for all eternity and organized itself on its own, there's this powerful thing called evolution, which essentially doesn't exist, right? That we give that glory or that credit to the one who actually did make us, but, but what is giving of thanksgiving and credit except worship, okay? We owe him worship for who he is. He's so great. All he has done and all he continues to do. You see, not to do this would be to be terribly ungrateful to God. Well, if we owe him worship, we need to understand worship takes time, doesn't it? You know, it takes time to do everything, and worship is no exception. It takes, as Ezra Edwards would argue, a specific time, a time we set aside that would be uninterrupted because of the greatness of this being that we wouldn't be interrupted by things that are far less important, undistracted time, where we set aside our usual work or maybe recreations, things that we would do. And since everybody should be worshiping this being because he's made all of us, okay, it should be the same time for everybody. And the reason behind that is so that because of the greatness of this being and the need to worship him in an undistracted way, we don't want to be distracted by the people who aren't worshiping him. 
See, we should do it all at the same time so we don't distract one another. I mean, just think about all the cars that are driving by right now. Think about over the, over the several hundreds of Lord's Days that we've met together, how many times somebody guns their engine or somebody makes a left-hand turn over here and just you know, hits, hits their Harley you know, and with their open pipes and just drowns out what we're doing. So we have to pause. It, it interrupts us. Or how many times the landscaper who takes care of the lot next door used to run his blower right at the time the sermon would begin. And then we'd have to compete with the blower. You see, all these are distractions that shouldn't be there because we should all be worshiping the true God in an undistracted way. We need time. We need uninterrupted time. We need then a common time. But then the question arises, well, how often should we have these, these times of worship? Do, does it really matter? Is once a year enough? Or maybe every other year? Or should it be every day? Should it be several times a day? Now, Edwards would argue if the times are too far apart, then we may easily drift away from God and, and forget that He even exists, although that would be hard to do for anybody who truly knows Him. But the, the longer we're away from Him, the more we tend to fall away from Him. But if it's too close together, then we may not have the time we need to do all the other things that we know our, our duty, taking, you know, working to take care of ourselves, working to take care of our families. If we're worshiping all the time, then we wouldn't be able to do those things. So there's, there's a balance here. And uh, there, there has to be a frequency, an interval that works better than another. And then how long should we worship when we actually do worship? When we set this time aside, how long should it be? Well, again, if it's too brief, it may not be long enough to disconnect from the world and focus on the Lord. Um, if it's, you know, too long, then again, it might interrupt the other duties which, which this being calls us to do. Now, we might be able to, through experimentation, you know, come up or get close to what's best, something that works, you know, as far as frequency, how often, and length, how long. But God has not left us, you know, left it up to us to figure it out. God has, has shown us what the perfect balance is. Now, what I've said is from nature, we understand that we do need time to worship Him. But we can't know the exact balance except through revelation. And that is what the Lord has given to us in the fourth commandment. He says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Work six days, rest on the seventh that is the right balance. That is the best balance. Now, that's, again, what we're going to look at. We're going to look at, at that, its institution. We're going to look at its, at its observance through the Old Covenant. We're going to look at indications that it's still observed in the New Covenant tonight. But let me just close by saying this, that if we think of the Sabbath as a burden, it, it shouldn't be a burden. It shouldn't be any more of a burden than keeping of the other nine commandments should be a burden to us. If we love the Lord, they shouldn't be. Because if we love Him, we'll want to please Him. And if keeping the commandments pleases Him, then those are the things that we will love to do, you see. They're not going to be hard for us. Listen to what John writes in 1 John 5, 3. For this is the love of God. This is how we love Him. That we keep His commandments. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Okay, John is saying that's what God says to us as well. I mean, Jesus is God in human flesh. If you love me, keep my commandments. And then he goes on to say this. And His commandments are not burdensome. You see, it's never a burden to do what you want to do. It's only a burden when you try or try to force yourself to do something against your will, something you don't want to do. That's what makes it hard. But if you love the Lord and you want to please Him, John is saying the commandments will not be a burden to you. So we need to think of the Sabbath in this way. The one whom we love the most is calling us to spend the day with Him. Now, how great is that? It, when you really love someone, you want to spend time with them, right? If you love them with, with all that you have, I mean, just thinking about the early days of, 
of your courting and so forth and how much you loved your, your spouse and you just wanted to be with her all the time or you wanted to be with him. See, that's the way love is. Love makes you want to spend time with that one. Well, if we love the Lord, then we shouldn't see this as a burden, but rather a blessing that he would, would command us to put everything else aside and do what we really want to do. You see, the Sabbath also, uh, along these lines, can be a spiritual barometer of our love for Him because the more we want to do it, it shows how much we love Him. The less we want to do it shows maybe we don't love Him as much as, as we thought. And I should say this too. Even if we're convinced from the Bible that the Sabbath doesn't continue, in our hearts we should still be saying, I wish there were such a day that I could spend with the Lord because I love Him. And I'm always trying to find time to spend with Him, and I can't seem to find enough time. Well, God's giving me that time. I just simply need to take it. So if we look at it the right way, we, should, we shouldn't say, well, drat, today is the Sabbath, and I have to spend it with God. But we should be saying this, today is the Sabbath. I wish every day were the Sabbath that I could spend with Him, because that's the kind of love that we need to have for the Lord. I mean, think about this. If, if we find ourselves in a situation where we don't want to spend even a day with Him on earth, what makes us think that we're going to enjoy spending eternity with Him in heaven where every day is the Sabbath day? You see, this is really just a picture of what we're going to be doing in heaven. If we don't like this, we're not going to like that either. And that's something that we need to think about because that, that is a serious, serious issue. And particularly as we now prepare to come to the table, because the table is for those who, who love the Lord, for those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, for those who are turning from their sins. As we're reminded in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, okay, where Paul is writing to the Corinthians and he's explaining to them why God is disciplining them, why some of them are weak and some are sick, and a number have died, it's because they were abusing the Lord's table. And that reminds us that we need to examine ourselves before we come to the table to make sure that we're trusting Jesus and to make sure that we're repenting of our sins. And I think along those lines, repenting of things that we may be doing on the Sabbath that we shouldn't be doing, and maybe more particularly things we aren't doing on the Sabbath which we should be doing, which is spending time with the Lord, using the different ways He's given us to draw near to Him. So with those things in mind, let's take just a moment in silent prayer and let's ask the Lord to prepare us to come to the table.